All right, folks. So what we have here is a bandpass filter that we use for ham or amateur radio. Um, over the last couple of days, I built this filter. And in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what bandpass filters are, why we would use them. We're going to look at the plans that I used to build this. We're going to go over the materials. We're going to go ahead and we're going to build it. And then we are going to test it on a spectrum analyzer. So if, uh, if that sounds cool to you, stay tuned and check it out. So it probably makes a little bit of sense to actually talk about what a bandpass filter is. We're not going to go in depth because we are assuming that uh, folks are familiar. But in the simplest term, it bandpass filters allows a desired span of frequencies into and out of a radio station while rejecting or attenuating undesired spans of frequencies. This is done to improve signal quality while both transmitting and receiving. What can happen in crowded spaces, when I talk about crowded spaces, I talk about where there are lots of people broadcasting and receiving signals. Radios can pick up some of those signals as interference, and it can impact your ability to listen. So what we want to do is we want to use a bandpass filter to block the frequencies or reject frequencies that we don't want to hear. Now, this requires people to operate on different bands if they are in proximity. Because if you have an interfering station operating on the same frequencies that you're operating on, a bandpass filter will be of no help. So I want to credit a source. This is from MarkI Microwave or RF-Tools.com. And what you can see here is a graph. It is depicted on its vertical axis in power or decibels and its horizontal axis in frequency. And this is a uh, what we would call a 20 megahertz I'm sorry, 20 meter or 14 megahertz bandpass filter depiction. The blue line represents the frequencies as they are attenuated. So you can see in the middle we have 0 dB of attenuation and lower and lower we go as we move to the right and left of those frequencies. Now we want to talk a little bit about how to read these charts because when we test the bandpass filter that we build, we're going to go ahead and we're going to read a chart similar to this. The red or fuchsia line, I think it's fuchsia, represents uh, what is called return loss, and we're not really so much concerned about that right now. So what I wanted to point off is when you measure the effective range of a bandpass filter, you consider about 3 dB down your roll-off or cutoff frequency. So that would be considered the effective range of your bandpass filter. So we have that marked here in a green line. And in these light blue lines, that is marked at that roll-off or 3 dB down frequency. So you have your FL, or your lower frequency, which is the lower end of your bandpass, and your FH, which is the higher frequency of the bandpass. The distance between FL and FH is considered your bandwidth, and that would be how much spectrum or frequencies your bandpass filter is appropriate for. Okay, this is a schematic that shows the bandpass filter that we're going to construct. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because uh, this is a little bit difficult to read to folks who are new to this type of thing. If it's old hat to you, then this should be relatively simple and understand pretty, pretty quickly. But this is a Butterworth design. There are many different designs of bandpass filters, each with their own pros and cons. We're choosing a Butterworth because, one, it was in the document that we're going to use to build this or in our plans, and it's also relatively simple. It's considered a third-order filter as depicted by the three columns labeled 1, 2, and 3. In the first column, which you can see are parallel uh, components. The first one's an inductor. The, the second one is a capacitor. The inductor rating is 280 nanohenries. The capacitor rating is 500 picofarads. And they are the same ratings for the components in order three, or the third column. You can see that depicted there. Our parallel components, I'm sorry, our series pick components, all this talking is driving me crazy, are in column two, and that is a 2.8 microhenry inductor and a 50 picofarad capacitor. Now, I used a tool called LC to do the schematic that we just looked at. And in LC, you can do a projection of what your response is going to look like. Now, this looks a little bit different than the one we did in RF Tools, but that's okay. Again, this is just a depiction that we're expecting. So what I see when I look at this is that 
it appears that our bandpass filter is going to work from a projection standpoint. But again, things in theory generally don't turn out the same in practice because there are external factors that may impact your design, your build, the materials that you use, uh, the length of the legs on certain components, all kinds of things. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get building in one second. But I wanted to talk a little bit about our project goals. Now, our project goal is simple. We want to build a 20-meter bandpass filter. Simple enough, right? And um, that's going to operate on the 14 megahertz uh, frequencies. Now, when you look at bandpass filters, there's a couple of things that you want to consider. It needs to attenuate the appropriate signals, right? So you want to attenuate the bad stuff, not attenuate the good stuff. So that is our first objective. The second objective is, is that you want to use sharp or steep skirts, and they are the um, declines in those diagrams that we looked at. The reason you want sharp or steep skirts is that you don't want to pick up other signals that are adjacent to the signals in the 20 meter band. And the sharper those skirts are, the less likely that is to happen. Now, there's all kinds of trade-offs when you build a bandpass filter because getting all three of these things correctly um, is difficult. And the last thing is, is we want is low insertion loss. So when you interject anything into the connection between your radio and your antenna, it's called your antenna system when you include your antenna there, um, it can introduce insertion loss. And that is something that we don't want. Insertion loss works bidirectionally. It will reduce your signal going out and it will reduce the signal coming in. So again, it's very important that anything that we put in line will have low insertion loss. Okay, so what I did is I searched the internet high and low to find some documentation about building your own bandpass filters. And what we found was this document from the ARRL.org. Um, it's by a gentleman by the name of Lou Gordon, K4VX. And uh, I believe this was for QST Magazine. And I believe our friend Lou has done multiple articles for them. But uh, here we have bandpass filters for HF transceivers. Do your multi, mul I'm sorry, do your multiple transmitter field day or contest efforts suffer from interstation interference? These handy and inexpensive filters can help. It's exactly what we're looking for. But today, in addition to field day and contesting, what we see are groups of buddies will go out to parks on the air. They'll, do, they'll go to a park and want to do parks on the air. And uh, they could be causing interference to each other, what he's calling here interstation interference, um, depending upon uh, the proximity of the antennas and the amount of power that they're using. Um, they could just be wrecking havoc. So that's why today hams are looking for these things. Um, they can be expensive, so a lot of hams are looking to uh, do their own. And that's what we're looking at here. There will be a link to this below so you can read all of it in its totality, but we're not going to do that right now. A couple things I do want to point out is, is that here you can see um, they're looking to do a 100-watt version. So that's what we're looking to do here. We're looking to build one of these for 100 watts. Um, and they go through the filter design and construction. Here is a uh, basic schematic. It is a three-pole Butterworth bandpass filter. As you learn more and more about um, bandpass filters and components and things like that, um, some folks will build a five pole Butterworth because they think it has steeper drop off and more stability at the top. Um, but this is the product that we're gonna build here. And then you can see it's a simple in and out. Um, you have uh, two uh, components here. You have a capacitor and an inductor um, in parallel. Then you have an inductor and a capacitor in series. And then you have a capacitor and inductor in parallel again. Um, down here is a table that we are going to pay uh, some attention to. Uh, the first column is the band. And so for this project, we are going to do 14 megahertz because we want to do 20 uh, meter band. The second column is capacitor one and capacitor three have a value of 500 picofarads. Capacitor two has a value of 50. Inductors, we use the letter L to show for inductors. Uh, inductors one and three are going to have 0.28 microhenries and inductor two will have 2.8 microhenries. So for this project, uh, it may be uh, a good idea for you to go ahead and have a capacitance or an inductance meter, often called an LC meter or an LCR meter. Um, here you'll see when we go over the parts, um, T68-6 cores and T80-6 cores are what is recommended. 
and they talk about the number of turns of your uh, enameled magnet wire on your core. For inductors one and, two, one and three and two, and then here for the 80, um, it changes with size. And then your filter, um, uh, your frequency in megahertz uh, here at the end. Now here they talk a lot about on the uh, on the right hand side of different uh, toroidal cores and and different things that you can use and the gist of what I remember here is is that here if you use T80-6 cores you can use larger wire for these inductors and winding the inductors start with the number of turns specified in Table One. Um, we're actually going to use T94 cores uh, for uh, availability in my parts box reasons and we should be fine. But again, larger cores, larger wire typically will help you with um, higher higher wattage. And again, we want to be somewhere around 100 watts. So bigger is better. Uh, down here, they talk a little bit about the capacitors. Um, silver mica, again, is something that is typically recommended. Um, you can use polystyrene capacitors, which are very difficult to find. As a matter of fact, I had some trouble finding silver mica capacitors, so I'm trying to stock up on those. Um, and then he also talks somewhere around, around using 20% tolerance disc ceramic capacitors. I wouldn't do that. Um, but you want your capacitors to be rated at 500 volts or higher. He goes over tuning in the filters. Uh, we'll, we'll tune these as we do a build. Um, here is the actual physical parts layout. Um, and you'll see that as we build out the box. And then actually this is the PCB board pattern that we want um, when we go ahead and we etch our board. And we're going to do a physical or manual etching. We're not going to be using any of the, um, of the acid that they use to do that. It's not going to be an acid etch board. And I really think that that is going to cover uh, what we want to. You can read this, like I said, article in its totality via the link below. All right, let's move on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the parts that we are going to need to do this particular project. And we'll start by talking about this uh, Hammond box. Now, they recommended a size uh, for this. I think it was the 1590N, and this is like 1590N1, I believe. Uh, so I couldn't find the exact one, but this is close, and it should get us there. It's just an aluminum box that uh, we're going to use to house our bandpass filter. Um, it does come with some screws that you use to mount that there. And it also came with some rubber feet that I probably will not use, but uh, that's okay. These are sold to three packs and uh, I'll have a link below. Now on either side of this box, we're going to need to put an input and an output for our signal. And uh, we're gonna use these SO239 connectors that I have. If you buy these, uh, what I would say is, is that make sure that you're getting 50 ohm connectors or bulkhead connectors, I think is what these are called. You don't want to accidentally buy 75. Um, and we'll mount them similarly to what we did on the RF tap project that uh, we did a couple of weeks ago. And so that will be that. Now, in terms of the innards, um, according to the instructions, what they recommend is, is you buy some of this copper lined PCB board. And uh, we'll have to manipulate this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is we're going to have to isolate some mount points, but also we're going to have to cut. And I cut this with a pair of shears, this to fit into the bottom, like so. Now when we do this, we're going to have to somehow fasten this. Uh, some folks will drill holes and then put some mounting hardware in there. And we're not going to do that because the mounting hardware will cause something less than flat on the bottom of this. So what we're going to do is use some of our favorite stuff, Gorilla double-sided tape, and we'll just put that down underneath, and we should be fine uh, with that. Now, when you read the instructions, there are a couple of different things there. Um, these yellow toroids are mix six. These are mix two powdered iron toroidal cores, or toroids as we call them. This is a 68 uh, is the size for this, and let me see if I can find all right, I tried to use my calipers to measure these so we could have an educational session here, but the batteries are dead, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put that over here for now. But uh, I believe these are T68s, and this is the means that they're uh, 0.68 of an inch in diameter, uh, for the outer diameter. Uh, what is said in the article, I believe, is, is that these are a little bit smaller, uh, a little, you have to use a little bit thinner magnet wire when you wind these, and they struggle a little bit at 100 watts which is the goal of this project. We want a 100 watt bandpass filter. So it says to use a T80 
And uh, that's what this is. So this would be 0.8 of an inch in uh, diameter on the outer edge, outer diameter. And you can see it's a little bit bigger, but unfortunately I do not have the type six mix. I only have the type two mix. I probably could use this and I probably would be just fine. Um, these in type two cost about $2, 250 a piece. But uh, we're going to use these. They're a little bit bigger. So these are Type 6 mix, and uh, I believe these are T94s. They might be 97s, 96s, or something like that. But they're close to an inch across, so they're a little bit bigger, um, much bigger than the, than the 60s. Um, you can see that right here. And so this will help us in our quest to use 100 watts. Not that big of a deal. Uh, what they recommended is a 20-gauge magnet wire. So that's what we have here from... BN Tech Go and uh, really like this company. I use a lot of their wire for a lot of different projects. There'll be links to all this stuff in the bottom so you can pick it up if you want. Um, and then the final thing that we need are some capacitors. And what I'd like to use and what is recommended is these silver mica capacitors. They're supposed to be a little bit better, have a little bit better tolerance, um, and last a little longer than things like these ceramic capacitors. Now, I'm not an expert on capacitors, but if you are, I'd love to hear all about it down in the comment section below. We are going to use these silver mica capacitors, which are more expensive. These are about $250 a piece. These are practically free. But again, we want to build a quality product that will stand the test of time, stand up to use, and, uh, and work well for us. So what we needed is a 50 picofarad and two 500s, and that's what we have right here. All right, let's get to building. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about where we are in the project. I have this project box, and I took it outside and I drilled some holes in here. Um, this one's a little crooked, maybe the drill bit got away from me, but this one doesn't look too bad. Um, I put a dust cap on here. I don't know if I'm gonna leave the dust caps on or not. Uh, that's something I'll have to decide. Um, but anyhow, we mounted our connectors after drilling the holes, and then I put these, I used these I-rings or O-rings to put a jumper here. And the reason I did that is, is that we have the PCB board that we're going to put down on the bottom. Don't laugh too hard. The PCB board is going to act as a ground plane, but I need a spot where I can solder components along the center pin. So we have these isolated squares here. I used a Dremel to cut that out. It's not the best job or the prettiest job, but it'll work. As I mentioned, we're going to use the Gorilla Tape or the Ape Tape to mount this to the bottom of the box like so. And then I am going to go ahead and I am going to solder these down so that way the shield connection from our coaxial cable is connected to the ground plane inside of the box. In addition to that, we are going to use some 18 gauge magnet wire. Now this stuff is enamel coated, so you need to use something like this. Um, it's just a razor blade to go ahead and scrape the enamel coating off. And then we're going to solder that from center pin down to this square. And then from this center pin over here down to that square. So let me go ahead and do that. I'll come back and then we'll talk about where we are. Oh, I almost forgot. When you buy these SO239 connectors, they typically don't come with mounting hardware. So in my videos, I often say, hey, take a gander at these nuts. Um, this is just an assortment of M2 through M3 different sized washers, nuts, and screws. And I find these things to be very handy. You can get these for about $12 on Amazon. Alrighty, let me go do some soldering. Okay, so what we have here is we've soldered these leads that I made. Again, these connect to the outer of the shield of our coax. They're connected to the frame here. And then we go ahead and we jump that down to our ground plane inside the box. And in case you're wondering, this is Teflon coated PTFE um, 18 gauge branded uh, or stranded copper wire that is slightly tinned. So there we go. 
Okay, so from looking at the, the table in the document, we know that we need two 500 picofarad capacitors for capacitor one and capacitor three. Um, it's a good idea to have a tool like this. You can measure capacitors with a multimeter, but uh, I use an LC meter because I can also measure inductance, which will be our toroids later in the video. Um, as far as LC meters go, this one works pretty well, but it's not an expensive model. It's around 50 bucks, and I'll have one linked below um, in the event that you want to pick one up. But anyhow, you just go ahead and you connect your, after calibrating, which is pretty simple, um, you just connect your capacitors up, and you can see this one's just over 500. Now, these silver mica caps have a tolerance of 5%, so that is well within spec. Let me go ahead and put this one on and see what we get. And that's within 5% as well. So what we want to do is we're going to weld, or we're going to solder these into our project box. Um, and from the schematic, what we see is, is that we want to, we're going to leverage these solder pads so that way one of these legs will be along our center where we have center pin connected through center pin. And then one of these legs will also be grounded via the solder pads that we put onto our ground plane. All right, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about where we are. Uh, we took our 500 picofarad capacitors and we soldered them here uh, from the center line into the ground plane. We also used the magnet wire. We scraped the ends and we soldered it from the center pin here down to the center connector. Uh, we did the same thing on this side. And then for our series uh, 50 uh, picofarad capacitor, we have that going along. So the next step for us is going to be to wind our toroids and test them. Uh, we're going to have one that is going to be in series here, and then the parallel ones will go on either side here and here. So we will see you when we do that. So uh, rather exciting news here. Um, just as I was getting ready to start rolling the toroids, uh, these showed up. The mailman got here and had these T80-6s. So if you remember, we had the T68-6, uh, we had the T80-2s. And then we had the T94-6, and we wanted these. We were going to compromise, use these bigger ones, but now we don't have to. We're going to use these. I will come back when these are wrapped and ready for testing. All right, so we have our toroids wound. These two, this and one, and this one here, connected to the meter, are one and three. And these are supposed to be around 0.28 microhenries. And as you can see right now, it's saying 0.264. So what I can do is I can adjust the winding or the spacing here to get closer to 2.8. Um, worst case scenario is I can add another winding to it, but I think I should be able to get it uh, by moving or adjusting these closer. So that looks about right for that one. Now, what's tricky is, is that these things pick up uh, reactants from things that are near them. So actually mounting it in the box and all that other stuff could cause problems and that's what makes building these things so difficult let's go ahead and connect to this one and see what we get okay wow so that one is super duper low um what we're actually going to do with this one is is that we're going to add another winding real quick and then we are going to test it again oh i also want to note i did have to scrape the enamel off of these and so adding this winding to that made, uh, made that leg very short. So I'm probably going to be in a little bit of a pickle here when it comes time to mount these in a box. But uh, we'll go ahead and we'll give it a try and see what happens. And that's still uh, a little low. So what we can do is we can kind of start scooching these things together and seeing what we get. All right, we get two, nine, three. And we'll have to go through this tuning process once everything is also mounted in the box. Two, nine, three, that didn't change at all. Let's give it one more little, little scooch and see what happens. It went up. All right, well, I'm going to continue to work on these, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Oh, I just wanted to quick show the one for in-series. It's supposed to be 2.8. Uh, here we're at 2.9. And uh, again, we can spread these out just a little bit and probably get that to drop. We don't want it to, to drop very much. Let's try just a little more. All 
And I think that's what we're going to go with. All right, folks, stay tuned. Okay, so there's a couple of things uh, that I'm concerned about when we were done. One is this capacitor was laying flat, and I was afraid that this leg was touching the ground plane, which would have been bad. So I corrected that, and then I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but here, when I soldered this toroid on, it the solder did bridge again to the ground plane, which could be a little bit of an issue. Um, and then here, it looks like this leg could be causing a problem, but it doesn't. There's there's a there's space there. So um, we'll hook it up, and it'll. It, <laughs> I'm sure that it works as a bandpass filter. I'm just not convinced it's going to be on the frequencies that we want. So we'll try it out, and uh, we'll see what happens. So here we are connected to the Siglent uh, Spectrum Analyzer. It is a 3120. And I just wanted to point out that you see two ports on the front. The left port is the tracking generator or signal, and that is coming out and going into the bandpass filter, which comes out and then goes into the RF input. And then we measure it. Um, I decided to use the Spectrum Analyzer for this project instead of the Nano VNA um, because I hadn't used the Spectrum Analyzer in a while and I like to play with it. So let's take a look at the results and talk about that. So here is the results of the scan. And what you can see is I have two data points. Uh, they're called markers, markers number one and two, and you can see them in the marker table below. You can see that marker number one is at 11.06 megahertz and marker number two is at 13.8. Eight, six. Now, the 20 meter band or 14 megahertz spectrum that we wanted to cover is from 14 to 14.35, uh, 14.350. So our peak is not exactly where we want it. Now, these markers are right at around 3 dB of roll off. So you remember when we talked about what the roll off was in terms of bandwidth earlier in the video. So if you look at this, we go from 11 to 12 to 13 to, to 14, which is almost 3 megahertz of spectrum, which is, again, a little bit bigger than we want. Now, the roll-off on the higher end, the higher frequencies, looks pretty good. Um, it could go deeper and more attenuation. Um, that would be nicer. But on the lower end of the spectrum, it really doesn't roll off quite so well. So uh, I do think that uh, this is going to warrant a rebuild and another attempt at putting one of these together. I don't know if I'm going to try to save this one or if I'm just going to scavenge this one for parts and start fresh. So a couple of different things that I wanted to talk about in retrospect. Um, it does work, but it doesn't do exactly what we wanted it to do. And if you remember from our goals, the first thing is, is that it needs to pass the frequencies we want and attenuate the others, and it doesn't do that. Um, we wanted it to have steep shoulders or a steep skirt. Um, it does kind of on one side, but not the other. So that is a little bit of a problem. And it's supposed to have low insertion loss. Um, it does. It does have low insertion loss on frequencies, but they're not the frequencies that we want to have low insertion loss on. So I think this is a, a little bit of a swing and a miss. It was a good project. It was a good learning experience. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to try a round two. We're going to try to build another one and see how that goes. One of the things that I did is I built this in the box. And if I could go back in time, I would have built most of this outside of the box. Um, and maybe I would have gotten a little bit cleaner connections and done a little bit of a better job. But, um, you know, I'm happy with the project overall. I'm glad I did it. And, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes things don't turn out exactly as you want and you have to try again. So with that, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks for watching, everybody.